she's one of the most incredible artists that I know. Um, I've been following her work for some time now, and I'm just so excited to have been able to share her work on my page, um, to have her work in my collection, and to see this exhibition unfold. You know, I've, I've been fortunate enough to kind of get some behind the scenes, but I'm just really excited to be here today and be in conversation with her. So like many of you, I have so many questions um, for her and I love hearing her talk about her work and love hearing her uh, talk about her process. So I'm going to go ahead and just kind of jump straight into it. So one of the questions that, you know, it's interesting because I don't think we've really had this conversation, but when did you first begin your creative journey? So that would almost be like asking, when did you discover that leftover stuff was useful? <laughs> like, we grew up, and I say we because I have a twin sister, Tokyo Rome, my back end, support, extra help, all of the things. And I actually have two twin brothers. So that's a whole nother discussion, uh -huh. a whole nother like whoa moment in life if I gave you the detail of that and the amount of twins we have in my family. But we were not what you would say well off. We could even say we were like ATL PO. I say PO because it's past four. We couldn't afford those extra letters. That was not a, in the budget. So we spent a lot of time at home. My mom did a lot of work and over time just to make ends meet. And she really left us to our own devices. And I love to read. And I had... What I now realize as an adult is an incredible imagination. I can make worlds out of swirls, like literally. So I used to just take leftover popsicle sticks, random little string, little bit of paper. And I always made stuff to entertain myself because we didn't have cable. We didn't really have a whole lot of money to buy toys. And what we had was from Goodwill or whatever. So I got really good at entertaining myself. We were not allowed to go outside either. That was the other thing. Like outdoors meant like those are the bad people, those are the, the criminals and they're gonna pull you into stuff. <laughs> so we had to stay in a confined space and it's four of us. So yeah, you have to figure out how to make it work. And we didn't even have a radio, like the radio got two stations. Oh, wow. yeah. Yeah, that's a, like I said, couldn't afford so, no so I think at some point in time as artists, we, we recognize that creativity um, is more than just that. So my question, my next question is like, once you discovered this creative side, and what was it that really interested you? What was it that made you want to take it further? Or was it, did you recognize it at that time? Or did that come later? I'll be honest with you. And Fran is so interesting that you came in on that question. So I had a friend that I was going to answer <laughs> named Francine Sinkler. And she was an art teacher over at M. Magnus Jones down in the West End area. And we would have these interactions and, you know, meet and do all these little things. We had like this youth art show or something, some way we made art. And at the time I was painting on foam core just because it was laying around. And I will never forget, Fran was like, stop, do not ever paint anything else on foam core. <laughs> you have something here. Stop playing with it, take it seriously, buy some proper materials. Because once the den is there, you can do nothing with this. Nobody will want this. And this has value. I never took it that way. I looked at it as I make things. But the, the component where there is value or a monetization of it, I can't imagine how many drawings or demos, so to speak, I've given away in the course of being an art teacher. So. Those demos in, in hindsight were really nice things because who makes in it for the bad? So if they asked for it, I would just be like, here, take this, take that. And ultimately that conversation with friend and to be honest, getting divorced. Like I got divorced and I had to evaluate, what do I want my life to look like? I know what I don't want it to look like. I know what I don't want very concretely and, and like definitively. There's this gap of space now because I'm not at the will and forgive the word mercy of an individual's wants and needs. And that's all about me and the kids and what I want my future to look like. So 
And sitting back and just reflecting on that between friends, and I had this guy friend at the time, Marlon. Marlon was like, and Toki, I mean, what are you going to do with all that work under your bed? I mean, you just throw it under there. I mean, you try to sell that. Ben's never going to give you any money. <laughs> so <laughs> I started to like think about it at the very least, and thinking about it, and just keep on doing the work. It became, for lack of a better word, a, a obsession. Like, that's mm -hmm. all I started to revolve around. So it's and almost it, like therapy for you. It absolutely was therapy. I mean, I would say if there was a backstory to be told about the damage that a marriage can put into a person, there is also the backstory of what damage can do when it is glued back together properly. I think back to Japanese artists who take who take actual gold and put back together broken china. I, I'm far more valuable now than when I started. And that's how I look at it. Like, I don't resent that time in my life. I don't say, oh, I wish I'd have never, ever. That's not even in my thought process. I'm perfectly at peace with that decade of quite some of the bullshit, excuse the French, but that bullshit birthed something completely different. Like, we say iron sharpens iron. I went through a lot of heat and a lot of fire and it molded and grew into something much more valuable than the girl that he met and I was at the time, so yeah. Wow, so looking back on, you know, growing up and, you know, kind of finding objects and things to create with, can you talk to us about how those experiences led you to this amazing body of work, anything but brushes. And kind of talk to us about what that means. And so I've always took things and looked at them. We grew up in Goodwill, like Value Village, thrift stores. That's far more comfortable for me to be in than a mall. Like a mall is like this weird alien place. Why would you know me? Yeah. No man's land. It's like the place of retail consumerism. Like it's a trick. You're falling for the trap off this advertising. Anyway, I don't enjoy going in places like that. However, you put me in any type of secondhand store and I turn into a professional shopper. Like my eye is keen. I find quality. I got this jumper and this little toss over. Like my, literally my entire wardrobe comes from these places. And I love the treasure hunt. I love seeing value in things that people have discarded. I mean, there is this fascination for me and like intrinsic need to see what other possibilities are there. So even if looking at your ordinary anything, my brain, the subconscious is always clicking at hmm, what would that do if I did this, this, this? Even if I never get to it, like there's a file being created in the back of my head. I'd be like, might need that later, file that away. So when you look at your works, so I've seen some of your earlier works, which is absolutely beautiful and incredible work. And it was very figurative. And your work is still figurative, but it's so different. So and how did... Michi Miko would say, you had to get loose. Getting loose is freedom. And even in the work, I hope that it conveys this looseness, this freedom that was like, almost like I hadn't allowed myself that yet. Mm -hmm. Being in the type of relationship I was in was very constrained, very do this because this may be the reaction. Do this because this needs to be kept at peace, so to speak. So I was not a rock the boat. I was the, the people pleaser. People pleaser to punishment, like to my own detriment. So the figurative work was me working through even the idea of chaos, because those pieces all really spoke to beautiful women who are surrounded by chaos, because they still have these abstract backgrounds surrounded by chaos, but centered in their own peace and beauty. And at that time, that's what I was really trying to work through for myself and then women around me, right? Because we all go through these storms and these episodes. And we live through chaos as women because we're dealing with kids, our parents, if necessary, 
you know, day to day work, business. We're balancing all these balls. Hell, Stacey Avery Abrams just balanced the whole United States on her back and made us into a situation that is plausible and tenable. Black women focus through chaos in so many ways, past all the noise, past all the extra. And so those pieces were really me saluting that, acknowledging that, and working through it for myself. But this other body of work, that's almost like my therapy sessions to get to my new person. The cocoon work to get to the freedom of quality work. So, mm -hmm. so those so anything. Say that, so, ahead. would you say that this new body of work is your voice? Is Absolutely. truly your voice? Absolutely. This will be like I don't see myself shifting. I see myself evolving the word, playing in the space with the word, but never actually stepping away from the call, so to speak. So that. you found your voice. Absolutely. The voice is clear, wow. comfortable, like it feels like breath. It doesn't feel like a struggle. It doesn't feel like thought process anymore. It just feels like internal, external conscious thought. Wow. Wow. The work is absolutely incredible. Can you tell us about who these people are? So... I've never met any of these people physically, like literally in life, none of them. Mm -hmm. I am somebody who is very comfortable not knowing where something came from. The same way I like going in a secondhand store, not worrying about where that came from, but looking the at journey. Life, the journey of the thing and how it landed and became in front of me. So these pieces are actually what I consider to be ancestors from the past. They are spirits that have decided I am a gateway or a doorway into the space that they were not done with, that they would like to exist and have presence in. And in being in that presence or space, we, if we are in tune, can find answers, can find almost like this lost thread of our own history and past because they're bringing it forward through their memory. So... The longer I spend with them, the longer I'm creating the work, the more I understand what it is even for myself. It's almost like this self-discovery where you're, you're learning who is that that was on the other line of, a, of like a, 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 what do you say? What do you say? Like a, a, a pen pal. There's been a conversation and a dialogue, but I didn't know where that, voice was coming from I didn't know where that dialogue was like sourced at so the longer I'm there the more we get to know each other the back and forth becomes cleaner clearer and it's just like okay I know what that's about let's go so the more solid I am it, it's its own voice so to speak the more comfortable I am in the work okay well at what point did you realize so you found your voice and you're like, I'm comfortable in this. At what point did you realize, wait a minute, not only have I found my voice, but I'm a conduit for this other world, this other space. And how important was that to you? So to be fair, I really didn't have a name for it for a very long time. It just, if you've ever been to church, I put it like this, if you've ever been to church and you have been in the presence of a really good gospel performer. Mm. They can emit a certain frequency of sound that I don't care who you are. You will connect to that sound. Mm. You can be Bob with no rhythm and you're gonna be rocking on beat, but you must rock. It is a force unto itself. And it's almost like that thread of song started to come continually and regularly in the space that I was working in. Mm -hmm. As long as I was still enough and acknowledging it, it got louder and clearer. In the same way when you were at church, and at first you're like, oh, you get that you're being note. cute. You, you're trying to be cute in church. <laughs> you were trying to be cute, but then the spirit hit, that lady hit that big, big note. And it comes from her soul. It comes from the bottom of her feet. And it hits you. 
And so now you're in the way of the spirit with everybody else, right? So that's the work at this point. Like I've accepted the wave of the work and what it means and what it's coming from. And now I just wait for that feeling and enjoy it. So wow. anything but brush is really me connecting to a subconscious that can hear this that I'm not I, that I'm not necessarily in touch with. So do you think that this process, the way that you work, um, can you describe how you work? And do you think that using the tools that you use in the way that you use it, do you think that that allows, allows for like a greater connection with the work or? So I'm using anything but a brush that literally means all of the pieces in this series are created with kitchen spatulas, I get most of them from Dollar Tree and I'll cut little different nicks in them so they make different marks. I'll use an old credit card, caps, big sizes, small, just random items because I'm really trying to disconnect from the mark. I need the mark to be in and of itself almost like an accident. And in the accident, it's not really an accident. It's like fine post to where I need to go. If I'm in control of it, if I'm actively creating, I'm going to put this, this, in, this in here with a paintbrush, I'm losing the looseness. I'm losing the connection that I feel like I have to have with subcon subconsciousness who and what is in tune with the in-between. If I'm driving, so to speak, it's going to look a lot more contrived. It's not going to have that flow and it's not going to have that energy that I'm trying to capture in that surface. So. I don't know if anybody on here has seen you work and I've seen you work and, and I found it just like it was almost like a ritual and to see you connect with the work and watching you talk but know that you're not speaking to me that you're talking to anybody but me it was like wow it was just incredible to me and so I've always been fascinated um about this process. So I'm curious to know, we have been going through this pandemic, we have been going through just, I mean, the political discourse that we're having, the just the total chaos of, of what the world has become. Have, do you think that that has, has had an impact in any way on the work that you're creating? You know, it's been a weird year and in looking at the work, even in pulling this stuff together for the show, I started looking at when the work got made. And it was like pre-COVID, post-COVID, pre-lockdown, after lockdown. 2019 work, whoa, 2020 work. There's so much more work from 2020. And the energy is so lively in the pieces that got made this year. And it's weird because I distinctly remember having COVID. Like <laughs> I was in a place of, I cannot get out of bed. I'm just going to watch Netflix. I'm just not involved in life. Like, what's the point? Like, where is the show going to be? Where is anything happening? Like, we just have to pretend like life is safe and it's not. I was so in my head. I spent like two months completely still. I mean, nothing from wow. March until like, I don't know. November, no, October, November. So maybe two months. I can't do math right now. I don't know why. My brain is somewhere else. But literally, I did nothing. And then when I stopped sitting still, it was just like, boom, boom. All the works on black paper got made within like two days. Wow. Stop. wow. And Chloe was like, yeah, do more. And I was like, I don't like these works on black paper. They're different. They're different. And she was like, no. And now I look at them and I'm like, yes, thank you, friend. Thank you for like bring all my noise because I wasn't on black paper. I wasn't dealing with that contrast of color at the time. And they so suit the time. It's a black time right now on so many subconscious deliberate levels. So, yeah. yeah. Wow. So I'm like, so I'm curious to know. So your work, and I always ask artists this because as an artist myself, this has been, I think, I've, I've struggled with this as well. These words are so intricately connected to you. There's like a soul connection, I would say. Do you have a hard time departing with them? Or is there a certain amount of time that you have to spend with each piece? 
Some of them, yeah. Like Breaking Blue. Mm -mm. It's not going anywhere. Meanwhile, there are other pieces that I'm really not as, you know, in love with. They 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 need their own space. They asking for free. They want to go. They want to have their own homes and their own. You've rooms. had that conversation. You need it with them. Some of them are much more. Like some of them, I really am like, no, not ready. There's pieces that people have reached out and I'm like, it's not available. Wow. And it's not available because it's just me. Nothing Can you else. show us like maybe two pieces in the show that you're really excited about? Mm, just so I have a problem. Just uh -uh. let's look around. Let's look around. Let's see if I can navigate. Hold on, hold on. Oh, these are beautiful. so beautiful. They're incredible. Okay, so we'll just start here and just slide around. We can talk and walk. I'm not a... So we wow. have... This is actually, I think, one of the last pieces that I made right before I was mm. ordered to put things down because I have a problem. Like I really prefer working to anything else. Like I have no social life. Don't get out much. I have my art friends, but if you're not an art friend, I don't know who you are. But your art friends are probably working while you're working. Yes, we're all in the mix. We're all in the flow. Wow, those strokes and the movements and the color and the layering. Those are incredible. So the, the, do any of the, I guess, the, the strokes that you're using... Not so much because there's no brush strokes there, but any of the, the marks that you're making during this mark making process, is there any significance to any of them? Or is this just purely uh, intuitive mark making? So we've got a little bit of both. Um, you'll see this kind of flickery flip of the wrist, so to speak, whippy line going throughout a lot of the work. And that's just my interpretation, I think, of what energy and movement looks like as it's coming out of between coming out of the space now that radiating design that you keep seeing and will keep seeing is actually what i consider to be energy i would say that's what i would epitomize of what the in-between looks like as it's being broken through mm -hmm. and then the in between again is the space between here and the netherworld or the the space where death and spirits live and to get back over, you've got to have a lot of energy to do that. You've got to break through that energy. It's a plain space. So, What is the role that color plays? So I love color. I'm obsessed with it on a certain level. I don't know what I would do if I was really forced to work in black and white. I mean, I suppose I could, but that would be a whole nother, like, I would have to come up with other ways to express the same meaning because the color tells its own story. Blue right now is like central to the work you'll see it in a lot of the words because oh, that's beautiful that represents the ocean to me and water i have a love hate relationship with water of course the body needs it and it's a part of your life on a daily basis but it's also something that for a lot of people in our history causes anxiety causes a sense of distrust and i almost feel like that's on a cellular level mm -hmm. blue represents the ocean but it's a reminiscent of what happened in the ocean and what and where we came from to get here those travels through deep blue seas and you know the people that got lost in that time period because uh -huh. of those in the waters and you were probably mm -hmm. So there was no concern for your life. And I look at water of life, but also how much life got lost within that same, what should be safe space because it's God's space, mm -hmm. but it got perverted, you know? So blue, orange, orange represents for me a sense of energy and also a sense of that energy breaking through the blue. Orange and blue are complementary colors and together they vibrate. And I'm trying to create this illusion again of 
the energy that you might experience when something is moving through space and has to reemerge on a different plane. Mm. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. So does scale play a part in your work? Because I noticed that your work is very large. Um, you had some pieces that were just incredibly large. Um, do, is there a, a different relationship between you and the larger work or you and the smaller work? I actually had to learn how to work small. Mm. I feel like, um, for lack of a better word, there, because it takes a lot of energy to come out, you need a good amount of space for that to happen. So there was this whole, like, how do I do this on a smaller scale? And I really haven't shown those that much, but those are where, where I started to play with jelly plates mm -hmm. and explore the whole concept of, okay, how do you scale this feeling down? Because big is absolutely what they need. It's a full body experience. So most of these is like what I'll say is um, playing Twister. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Everything happens on the floor. I'm working big and I'm trying to stretch without stepping on pain and not like knock into things that I like. Or so there's a physical work. connection to the work as well. Because when I watched you, it was literally like a dance it was literally like this um i don't know just a it was almost like a, a spiritual dance that was happening between you and the work and i mean until you see it it's just so incredible i mean i encourage everybody to um i think you might have some videos on your ig or something but um it was just so incredibly inspiring and emotional to see you work in that way. So it's funny that you even mentioned the dance of the thing. I actually have been trying to figure out and Toki bought me some little clicker things that I'm gonna experiment. Where I really wanna, I wanna film the actual working of the work mm -hmm. or photograph the working of the work and figure a way where that in and of itself becomes a part of the piece. And creation is ritual and the making there is a space that I'm hoping to convey is made. And in making that space, I'd love to see if it can be captured on film. So I love the idea of expanding these into other mediums. So what so beyond that, do, what what do you think is next for these pieces for this um style of work? Or you talked about um, pushing the work where do you see it going I'm really curious as to how I can get it off of the flat and figure a way to give it some type of level of depth around mm -hmm. and I'm playing around with a lot of collage and paper right now but ultimately I really want to have a way to make some low relief sculptures out of them mm -hmm. so that you can physically stand in space and, and create this physical presence that's not bound to a wall to literally get them free of the plan. So if that's possible, my brain is, you know, still trying to figure, still trying to get some clue as to how that could possibly work, but. Well, I have no doubt you'll figure that out. Yeah. No. Um, no. That's the goal right now. How do I get them out off of glass, off from underneath, and make them more of a presence within a space themselves? Mm. Well, I have, paper, so. I have one question that I want to ask before. Um, I'd love to bring the audience in and have them ask questions as well, because I want to make sure we get to their questions, because... I'm sure they have a ton of questions because I could talk all day. But one of the questions I want to ask you is what do you want the viewer to take away from this exhibition? So I need people to understand that our memory, the past, the things that we have experienced in our lives, we're all connected one. And in that connection, we have to remember what we left behind. Even if we can't physically remember it currently, there is this possibility. If we just slow down, we listen. Oh, no, yeah. 
Sadness. I forgot my life. So if you have any, um, if you're in the audience and you have any questions, um, please put them in the chat box and we will um, ask those questions as well. We got a lot of history that we don't know we have. We have a lot of um, underlying cellular memory for lack of a better word. And this is something I've done a little research on. I hope to do more. But you'll be surprised at what trauma will do to yourself. Trauma makes things stick in a way that is still really, really at the fresh early stages of research. But there's definitely evidence that when you go through deep trauma, especially within large mass groups, that trauma can be passed forward cellularly, cellularly through different generations. And in my mind, I really do believe that we're carrying for, yes, trauma, but also memory of rituals, rites, and things that we need to connect back to our ancestors. And once we connect back to them, we are allowed to learn the history. We're allowed to get support from those ancestors. They're here for us. But can you can step be- back from the largest Yes, piece step back, history? yes. And can you tell us the name of that piece? So this piece is called My Ancestor Speaks Life Into Me. And this piece is about the larger figure being almost like the divine and rod or the lighthouse that guides spirits toward me. She whispers into their ear. She tells them their memories, the history, the things that they've forgotten. She gives them a thread to find their way home. And in finding their way home, They hear my voice, they hear my hands, and they are delivered from the in-between. So she speaks life into my ancestors so that I can give them new life. Piece is eight foot by four feet. How big? Eight foot by four feet, plus the framing. So give or take another two or four inches. So do you consider this one to almost be like the anchor or the conduit guide for the other pieces? She is. She is. She's almost like spirit mother or if we were to talk in terms of ancestry here, she's like Moses. She's like the one that's going to call you toward the light and let you come back through a door. You might not know that there's even an opportunity, but she's whispering. She's constantly whispering and gathering up those that need to come. Very beautiful. Very, very beautiful. So let's see. Let's see if we have any more questions here. Um, Rebecca wants to know, do, do the paintings have stories that um, cover to you? I'm not quite sure. So, um, yeah. Each one of them has its own tale to tell. Just like this piece gives you its own history and what its purpose is. Every last one of them. They all have their memory and they deliver my story. It may not necessarily be the story that resonates with you, but for me, each one of them carries with them a tale that helps me understand. It's almost like they're delivering to you a message from your past that helps you follow forward with what you need to do. The same way this piece is asking you to listen because with memory, you learn how to move forward in your space toward where you should be. Grace, that's what this piece is called. For me, she's looking down, but she's got such an elegantness, a dignity. The glitter shows her value. Grace for me represents a woman who knows her work, who's down, but definitely not feeling down. Wow. So each one, again, has its own story that I see within them. So what do you think the, the um, so I know that you have a personal connection to the work. What would you say the universal connection to Um, You know, we can't control what people see in the work, but do you feel that there's a universal component in the work that allows the pieces to connect to everyone? So in my mind there is, but again, that's more of an audience question. For me, the abstraction helps 
it be universal. The yeah. abstraction is capturing energy. It's not capturing a face. It's not about the literal person, the figure that left. It's about the essence and the energy of that, the entity that is gone on. So you're allowing room for the viewer to connect. Because at the end of the day, their presence is not about their appearance. It's about the energy that they're trying to share with you. And that energy speaks to and guides you forward. That's what I hope people will see. Wow, it's so incredibly beautiful. So incredibly beautiful. So is, are there any more questions? Does anyone have any more other questions? Are these oil paintings or acrylic or both? So everything is acrylic. I work quick and I work um, very large and oils take too long. <laughs> yeah, I understand. Yeah, so it's What's the glitter? So the shiny business is diamond dust. And yeah, for me, diamond dust has a couple of representations. It's a subtle nod to the value that I know our people have. It's a subtle nod to the level and lengths that people will go to to get that value. Mm -hmm. It's a nod to the in-between and the magic that I feel like is captured within a space, but on this surface. So it's almost like my magic dust. Mm -hmm. I like to give the pieces. So here's a question that I always love to ask um, because I know um, you've given us so much in this work and so much of your energy, so much of, you know, this very um, intimate side of who you are as an artist and what your journey has been. Do you have any advice that you would give to say a student or an emerging artist? Because you, you've been teaching for 20 years. And, you know, you are, you know, in the education system and there are a lot of artists, young artists out there who are um, trying to come into their own. So I will say, one, be comfortable with failure. Be comfortable with no, be comfortable with messing up. We are quite capable of falling on our face, but the problem sometimes becomes, especially, I don't want to, call anybody out, but there's this lack of grit sometimes. You got to see where you fit in and be persistent. I tell anybody, this type of life, art life, it's not a, mar it, it's, it's not a sprint, it's a marathon. It's mm -hmm. a long haul journey and you've got to be willing to commit to your research, be ready to commit to making a network because you can make work by yourself. But will you ever get the feedback and the outside voices that help you hone your craft. You can make all the work in the world and share it with just your friends, but I honestly believe you must have a network of artists in your life who are honest with you, who support you also being wrong, not just right, but being wrong and telling you, hey, this is not working. I have that in my life and it has helped me grow and stretch and be willing to say, you know what, stop, walk away, come back another day. This is not it. And that's all right. right. Being accepting of the process because it's a process. That is what I will say. Wow, incredible. Do we have any other questions? Yes, we have one in the Facebook Live. Um, the question is, do you have any spiritual practices or rituals that aid in your creative process? And have you had to shift or include any spiritual practices in order to channel these unknown people? So I, I grew up in the church. Big Bethel, African-American Episcopalian. If you are in Atlanta, it is also known as the giant church that says Jesus saves. Now, my grandmother was the head of the usher board. We went to church regularly until maybe I was 13 or 14. I understood, but did not understand a lot of what happened in church because they assume and they have these activities. I say activities, you also might say rituals. 
that are not explained. You're just expected to kind of flow with what's happening. And eventually through, I don't know, osmosis, figure it out. So I say all that to say, I grew up in a church setting with proper so-called rituals, but the work that I do now really has nothing to do with that other than the acceptance that there is a higher power. I don't give it a name. God is G-O-D, but what falls as the afterthought underneath that can be Buddha, Allah, Jehovah. I'm not the one to make that decision. So when I'm creating this work, the connection that I feel is very, very, very tied to music. Like I said, when I was talking about the gospel church, there is something necessary about me playing a particular playlist. I'm obsessed with Jacob Banks. And Jacob Banks right now is probably, it's like the call to the author for me. It's the song that brings things forward. When I hear those certain tracks, and there's another guy, Ben Osol, and I'm saying his name wrong, he's a French guy, but I just found him. He has an eight minute track with a violin and some cellos. There are just certain pitches that when they hit, the spirit is right, I gotta have my coffee. I do my little thing with that, and I pour paint. There's nothing else. When I say pour paint, there is no plan, there is no, there's so, nothing other than the time. Spent to kind of me. piggyback off of that, we have a question um, from Rebecca, another question. How did you <laughs> discover the right medium for you? Is there a story or a process behind how you um, got to what feels right for you? I mean, did you go through, um, you know, several different processes before you discovered what process worked for you? For this, it always really boils down to acrylic paint, but the, the process of what to do kind of evolved. When I say evolved, the earlier pieces, like the piece you on the leader, mm -hmm. it really only had one spatula, they're smaller pieces. And I had a rule, you get one shot. So I had to be in the right head frame and I couldn't be too in my head. I had to let go really quickly. When I say let go, it had to be get it done, stop looking at what is done. Do the work, not look at the work. Right. And that early body of work was scary, to be honest, because I wasn't sure what the heck I was doing. Mm -hmm. What the heck I was doing was really So there's like a certain that. level of trust you had to have in yourself. Mm -hmm. and, and stepping back from what I normally was doing with the figurative work, those women in chaos were a completely different ball of wax. And it was like, you kind of know for this over here, mm -hmm. but it feels so good. This is making you happy in a way that was not the same. And they got a good response as well. So it was like, well, trust it, go with it and see where it lands. See how but how do you know when it's time to step away from the work? How do you know when it's when it's done? That's two ways, way. two ways, two ways. There are two ways. Sometimes it just feels like don't touch it. Sometimes it feels like if you touch it, the gods will be mad. You have no rights anymore. Someone else is guiding the fence post, so to speak. This is where it ends. And then there are other days when my brain is a percolator of ideals and they're boiling over. And there are so many things that I see and they're all at once and I see them and I just keep on wanting to see them. And this is where your network of artists come in at. Because all artists work and get in their own way at some point. We all need an editor, a critiquer, someone who can look at the work and see what you're too close, too next to to see. Mm -hmm. So sometimes so, you just have to step away and let it be for a minute and come back the next day. There's whole sessions where I refuse to even look at it. Wow. I'll take a couple of pictures and then it's like, I don't know, let me get up. I get up early in the morning and go downstairs and just see, ooh, or ah, oh. or I'll see literally exactly what needs to get fixed. Mm -hmm. The last little piece, mm -hmm. it's like out of the corner of your eye, like, mm. This is what I need to do. 
Mm. But again, it's always maybe two sessions. I don't usually touch them more than twice. Three times is a lot. When I say I touched them three times, that may be small edits and things, but normally mm -hmm. it turns into something else if I touch it too much. It gets convoluted with noise and my thoughts. And really my goal is to let the energy do the talking, not me, so. Wow. So a lot of people are so excited about um, the exhibition, excited about the work. So just really, really quick, is the gallery open to the public or is it by appointment only? If you can just kind of give some information, how long the exhibition is going to be up? So we're here until December the 15th and I am accepting appointments, small group, of course, mass and social distancing. I have mass here if you forget and sanitize and all that good stuff. But yes, um, you can make an appointment by emailing me at info at sidestudioart.com or if you go on my website, there's actually a link that you can click on that would allow you to just email and schedule something out. Wonderful, wonderful. We have another really, really good question. Um, do you feel that women of color slash women are growing, empowering themselves to become visionaries and leaders of the new arts mainstream? So I can't speak for a larger audience, but I can speak to the people that I deal with. I feel like we are very much comfortable, as you say, Delita, with our own voice and what we want to share. Mm -hmm. And we're past the point of really asking for permission or waiting around for someone to make a platform for it. Because ultimately, we are realizing continually, regularly, by looking around at what's already evident We've already got the right stuff. We've already got the deliverables. It's just a matter of putting in the time and the work and pushing forward past anybody's side eyes or question marks about what are you doing? Because what your question is really irrelevant. We're doing the work. Mm -hmm. So I think there is a, a, a nice population of Black women out here pushing. Museum Mammy's doing some really great things. There's a whole litany of people, and I think Instagram is doing a really, really amazing job of giving space and platforms that can help push the narrative forward without the required co-signers on your what have you that you're doing. So. Yeah, I, I think in combination, to kind of um, speak on what you're saying, I think the combination between social media and having to social distance and isolate ourselves, I think it's kind of change the art world in a very huge way. Um, you know, the audience has grown because you are here in Atlanta, but your work can be seen anywhere in the world, right. you know? And so it, it's definitely changing the game and opening up platforms, uh, you know, all over the world for, for artists in general. So yeah. yeah. TV is so dead. Like there's just not as much content being made in other areas. They need another avenue. They need something right. refreshing and new to enliven their minds. So I would say the pandemic has definitely opened people's eyes to the, to the necessary need for the art. Because what's sustaining you right now when you're stuck doing nothing? Yeah, there's been some wonderful work that has come out of this, um, out of the pandemic, out of, you know, and that's unfortunate, I mean, um, you know, I wish that we wouldn't have had to go through any of this to get to where we are in the art world now, but I really think there has been some, um, it's been a, a time of reflection for a lot of people, a lot of creative people, and a lot of um, powerful, impactful work has been created during this time. And you're an example of that, looking at the work that you've created during this time period and, you know, the conversations that are being had around the work that you're creating. You're the perfect example for that. Yeah, I really appreciate the openness of the time. I mean, even though I still work full time, it's a different dynamic. And your mind can really stay in a place of creation. I don't think I slowed down at all once I started back, whether work came back or not. 
Um, there's a comment. Um, I appreciate you making your art affordable and accessible through your prints. Um, it's really uh, special to be able to have your work um, and thank delete us in my home. home. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I really appreciate you guys taking the time today to join us. Yes, thank you so much. I have enjoyed this conversation. I feel like really lucky and really blessed that I can be behind the scenes and ask all these amazing questions, but um, to be able to share this with the public has been incredible. So is there anybody who's got any closing questions before we wrap it up? Oh, I don't know if my sister had an opportunity, but we are gonna have a nice catalog created with the foreword by um, Ida Harris, as well as Andre Sembe and uh, Kevin Sip. And that'll be available in the next couple of weeks. We'll be doing pre-orders for the holidays, definitely by Black Friday. Um, I have it up, Sasha. Okay, Toki's gonna give you guys a little preview of that if you're interested while I put this back. We've got a couple of poems that I've written in there. I do a lot of storytelling that goes along with the work. And I did include some of the um, poems and short little writings that I've done for some of the images. The catalog actually has um, more work in it than the actual show does. These are all current works within the last year of the pandemic. Some of the jelly prints that I started working with to work smaller so that I could kind of translate the, the energy, so to speak, into a smaller format. Mm. I love that you're sharing in this in this book. Um, I know it has more work than what's actually in the show, but I love that you're sharing like a full body of of um, this whole body of work that you that you've put together. Well, I really want people to have access to not just that you can see online, but the things that I'm creating in the studio, so that you if you can't afford to buy, you know, a large original, your home might not have that type of wall space. I'd like to give them as many opportunities to have a presence in the space that you live in and sharing that imagery and hopefully in some way still be able to deliver that, that message of acknowledgement and memory and hopefully as a signpost so that people can really see that the ancestors guide us forward. So that's just one way of also offering them another space to live in. Mm, beautiful, beautiful. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank you for coming. I appreciate you guys for joining us today on this dreary little windy Saturday out here. If someone wants to get your book, Sashi, how do they go about pre-ordering? And what, so do you have a price wait. point? I'm sorry, do you also have a price point um, set already for it? Yeah, the books are going to be $25 plus shipping. And I'm going to have a link up later in the day that will allow you to pre-order. And I'll start doing that. The book itself should be available to ship by the holiday. Great, great. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for sharing your amazing talent, um, your wonderful words. So glad you're my friend. Thank you, thank you, thank you. For coming, everybody. So appreciated this, Alita. You guys have a wonderful afternoon and I look forward to, if you're interested in seeing the work in person again, you're welcome to come down, schedule an appointment. I'm available and the work is incredible in person. It gives its own energy off in this space. So again, if you have the opportunity, it'll be up until December the 15th, friend. So. We've got some holiday planning that we can do, and I would love to have some company down here with them. Great. And again, a link on my website, if you want to schedule a visit, you can just go to the homepage 
and there's a contact form so we can schedule something for you. Thank you, Rachel, so much. Bye, guys. Bye.